Does it fit? It fits. Here we go. And remember, Chris, I can I can trim out the beginning boring parts that we're doing right now. Okay. So we, we are on air now? We are on air. We are broadcasting live from Woodchat Corporate Headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. So today we're talking about uh, glue, glues, gluing techniques, and other, whatever you have on your mind. Matt, are we going to invite other people in as well? We could, yeah. Okay. Brian, Brian's asking on Twitter how it's if he's going to get an invite or what what's happening. So. Uh, does Brian know how to join WoodChat? Is he just wondering how to join WoodChat, or is he wondering how to join the video? Join the, the Hangout. Okay. There's a message over here in the sidebar. Stop. Okay. Uh, I will talk to him on Twitter. Okay. So Brian, uh, Matt's gonna get in touch with you, let you know what's happening. So Andy, what's happening in the shop for you? Well, I've been uh, working fast and furious on uh, my split top rubo. Um, oh, I've been working on that for several months now uh, when I can get in the shop. Um, it's been a project that's been in the making actually for about three and a half years. I got a log, a maple log that fell during um, one of the hurricanes that came through here a couple years ago and okay. had it cut and dried outside in my side yard and finally was ready to build into something. So I decided to use it for a bench. Yeah, so I was reading your blog about uh, that log and the drying. Yep. Uh, so tell us about the drying a little bit. Um, well, you know, the, the air drying process, it was, that was kind of my first time. So I, you know, did what most people do and just kind of look online and read as much as I could about it. Um, I built a drying rack, which essentially is just an elevated platform with, you know, multiple two-by-four supports that kind of hold everything in place and covered it on the top and basically just stickered each of the pieces and let it dry for, you know, you're supposed to do about a year for every inch that's on the, uh, you know, as far as thickness goes. So I did about two and a half years worth of drying um, and then finally brought it inside, uh, milled it, at a, had it milled at a shop and then... Uh, Lost a little bit of the thickness, though. Um, some of the wood twisted and cupped and, you know, learned from my first time all the errors that you commonly make. Uh, mm -hmm. But it turned out all right. It saved money, at least at the end. Did you know when you got the tree you were going to use it for a bench? No, I had no idea what I was going to use it for. I just saw a big, you know, 12-foot, 25-inch diameter rock maple log, and I said, I want that. I want it cut into two-and-a-half-inch, you know, planks, and I didn't really think about what I was going to use it for until probably about eight months ago when I was able to bring it in and start kind of cutting it to length and getting rid of some of the waste. So mm -hmm. it, uh, it's just kind of a 
uh, opportunistic uh, thing, you know. That I guess it was about 300 board feet. Paid about 200 bucks for the whole thing to to be cut and everything. So, was this part of the guild build? What was for a guild build? Uh, no, um, I I had talked to uh, Jeff Miller, who was also building a split top rubo. I I trained with Jeff in Chicago uh, when I lived in Chicago. I was there for about eight years, and I did, like, part-time apprentice work with him. Wow, okay. So, so he told me a lot about the, the Rubo, and then, you know, I met Jamil and saw the saw the project at uh, WIA, and I said, i got to have that. Cool, very cool. Do you have a picture of your bench, Andy? Uh, it's still a uh, work in progress. Okay, all right. So I've, I've got various pieces uh, kind of all over the place right now. All right. So Super Dave says that uh, Type Bond 3 and Gorilla Glue PVA are his favorites for glue. Uh, how about you guys? What do you guys use? Uh, I, um, for a long time, was just using um, uh, Type Bond 2, I guess it was. And then I did some projects where uh, I needed some, what was it? I think it was some, I can't remember what it was, but I used the uh, the Type Bond trim glue. It's, it's thicker, and it sets up really fast, and it's kind of gap filling. Uh, then I used a lot of Type Bond 3, but lately I've been using a lot of the Gorilla PVA. Um, I just think it's at a different, better price point for me. And... Uh, I kind of got into that um, at WIA when they did the glue trade. Uh -huh. and that's, that's, where, that's when I really got my first bottle. And then um, I had a gift card that somebody had given me, and uh, I was out of glue, so I just went down and got about four bottles of the Gorilla Glue. And when I, when I built those mantles, I went through a couple of bottles. <laughs> yeah, lots of, glue, lots of glue in there. Yeah. yeah, I used about two bottles myself, two 18-ounce bottles. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Do you ever use um, any of the cyanoacrylate glues or the epoxies? Yes, I, I actually use them uh, extensively. Um, I've used CA glues for gluing as well as small repairs and finishing even. Um, epoxy I, I use for gluing as well as filling voids. Um, for PVA glues, my go-to, I use the Lee Valley stuff a lot, the 2002 GF gap filling, as well as tight bond free when I need a more uh, waterproof glue. Mm -hmm. um, I did use the... Um, Gorilla's got the small bottles of clear. I, I think it's a polyurethane glue. Yeah. Really? Um, and I used that when I needed to glue leather on my Gramercy Holdfast. You okay. use the clear uh, for the for the letter, yeah. okay? Yeah, it worked. It worked really, really well. I just um, I kind of made sure that the metal was clean and a little bit, a little bit scuffed up, and um, got the leather just slightly, just sprayed it, just a little bit moist. Um, after putting the clear glue on the metal, and then I just um, just tightened it down by smacking it into my bench. <laughs> And uh, after it was all um, cured, I cut around it with an X-Acto knife, and they've held for over a year perfectly. So uh, it works well. Yeah, I was actually I'm I'm in the process of you know making my bench dogs right now for my bench, and I'm gonna probably use a polyurethane glue for the uh, the leather on the bench dogs as well as everything else. I figure that's probably the best choice. Do you know, do you happen to know what the difference is between um, their their small bottles of their clear polyurethane glue and their larger bottles of the darker? Is there is there a significant difference there? Um, chemically, no. They're both polyurethane glues. One just has the pigment in it and the other is, is clear. Um, I don't believe there's any kind of... Uh, differences in terms of the, the dry time or anything else. I think they both have the same properties. You still want to use water, you know, like okay. any polyurethane-based glue. Um, I think it's just they, they package it in smaller 
sizes because typically the, the clear stuff is used for um, for people that are doing a lot of crafts and fabric applications so okay. you don't have to deal with any of the pigmentation coming through. Okay. The epoxy stuff as well, you talked about filling, uh, using it for filling voids. That was one of the first things I did when we were at uh, WIA back in, God, I think 2008 or 2009 in Chicago. And I, I just posted a link to a, a, a project that I did that basically showed how I use epoxy and wood dust. It's nothing new, but it works great. Yeah, I've, for filling voids, I've been using uh, just clear epoxy, no filler, no tints or anything. And I've, what it does is it makes, makes it look like there's a cavity, but you can't feel anything. That's cool. The visual effect? Yeah. I wanted to leave it open, but I didn't want it to actually be open, so that that was a good a good choice for me. What kind of applications is that for? Like just regular furniture or turnings or what? Uh, it could be for either. I'm building a table right now. It's got some voids in it, so I've been filling it with that. You could do turnings too, for sure. That's cool. You got any pictures of that? Uh, yeah, lots of my blog. Okay, um, I'll check it out. Yeah, I'll drop a link in. I'm gonna get some of the photos of you filling knot holes in the um, in the screen share real quick here. Sure. Okay. Yeah. BC Craftmaster. Uh, That's Type fine. on three. Yes. Open time. Likes the open time of Type on three. So it doesn't look like it's actually grabbing the right screen, does it? No. Uh, no, okay. No. I'll try again here. Here, I can... Uh... Okay. Super Dave's asking what a good uh, brand of hide glue is. There we go. Now, there's a, you can buy hide glue either in a bottle pre-mixed, or else you can buy it in granulars or pearls, which you add to water and you heat up to make your glue. Um, do you guys know if there are brands for the granular or the pearl hide glue, or is it just glue? I am not familiar myself with it. Um, the only hide glue I've, I've actually used is the liquid hide glue from Tight Bond. Yeah. Yeah, I've used that stuff. And then there's also the old brown glue from Patrick <laughs> Edwards, and that's supposed to be really good. Yeah. It's a little bit thicker, you have to heat it up before you use it. The tight bond stuff you can use out of the container, so it's super easy to get into if you're new to high glue. Do you use liquid high glue a lot? I have in the past. I've kind of gotten away from it as of late, though. What made you go away from it? Convenience. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. I mean, uh, it's... Well, yeah, they've all got... Yeah. They each have their merits, right? Mixing it and heating it, and it's just, you know, it yeah. seems like it's a lot of effort to just bond something together. Yeah, from the granular or the uh, furl stage, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it's nice that it'll, it'll set quickly, so you can do a rub joint. You can put the glue on both sides and rub it together, and as, as, it, shrink, as it dries, it shrinks, so it'll hold it together tightly. Yeah. The things yeah. that are odd to clamp, it's a great way to go. So, Andy, I've got your filling knot holes post on here. Gotcha. Um, so it looks like in the first step here, you've just gathered the epoxy, uh, 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 like a stick to spread the epoxy and some of the some of the wood dust. Yeah, basically you just I you know you can use it with any you can do the same technique with any kind of epoxy really. The the convenience of the the stuff that I use with Gorilla Glue is it's it's a five minute set. Um, so I basically. Just take the wood dust, you know, typically from, uh, you know, from the same piece or a similar piece, and you know, like 150 grit is fine. Sanding it down. Catcher, like your random orbit sander, a uh, little um, dust catcher. Yeah, yeah, you can pull it right out from there, um, and you know, it, it's not a very scientific process. You really, you know, you you want to put obviously more than enough epoxy in. You mix it up with you know, maybe a, a teaspoon of the of the dust to kind of get that kind of color that you have right there. 
Yeah, it looks like a big uh, thing of caramel. Yeah, it's exactly what it looks like. Um, and then, actually, before you, you want to use blue painter's tape, the greatest tool for woodworkers ever. Um, yeah. And basically, just kind of block off the area. Um, you can see a little bit of the outline there um, yeah. in that photo. Did you clean up inside that hole at all? What's that? Did you clean up inside that void at all? Yeah, you know, you. I mean, you. You want to you want to really be just concerned with kind of what's on the on the outside, like closer to the top, so that yeah. you can at least get the the epoxy to kind of move down. I've kept some of the gunk in there before as well, and it actually can work just as well. It, it looks a little bit more natural if you do have a a knot chunk that seems to be in place. But other times I just kind of dig it out completely and just kind of drizzle it in and then paste a bunch of it over the top. You want it to be a little proud of the surface, yeah. Um, and then, because it'll settle a little bit when it dries, give it 24 hours, and then you peel the painter's tape away and you just shave it down. Yeah, there's the shot of of just the the epoxy being kind of leveled out. But you once it dries, it, at all? you have to worry about air air bubbles. Um, best way to avoid the air bubbles is don't over mix it in the container first. Yeah, don't whip it, just mix it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Set it on a low stir setting instead of uh, uh, puree. Um, and you'll probably, you know, you'll get a, a few bubbles here and there, but for the most part between, you know, kind of pushing it in with the, the stick and um, just the sanding that you'll do afterwards, it gets rid of most of it. Okay. We're, we're talking epoxy here, right? I got lost, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Epoxy is wood filler. Right. Yeah, the thing I found with epoxy, working with the slow cure stuff, which sets in about 90 to 110 minutes instead of 5 minutes, is the, the air bubbles work out on their own. They so rise? The, yeah, the 5-minute stuff, um, you have to be more careful about air bubbles. Yeah. I've done this before where it's on a board, if you can, I've, I've lifted the board slightly and just dropped it on the bench and just that kind of, yeah. that wrapping on the bench is taking care of that. So, okay, I'm going to turn off the screen share now. I think we got that in the video, so. Yeah, yeah. cool. So what about the, uh, what is it, the, a lot of the glues for um, doing lamination is that, um, was it the urea glue? Urea formaldehyde? Yeah, have you guys used that? No, I haven't. No. I haven't used it either, and I'm not really interested in having that something that nasty in my shop. So Yeah, the, yeah. the plastic resin is highly toxic, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a great glue. I would, I would like to try it. Laminations, when you're talking about laminations, like bench top laminations or like bent laminations, thinner pieces... Probably I mean, lamination. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, you know, um, a lot in Montana just recently um, had some really nice maple, and he was making a, a large piece, and he didn't have enough maple to make the whole piece out of it. Mm -hmm. So he's he made his own veneer and applied it to like a Baltic birch, right? And a lot of times when guys do that, um, I know that Neil Layman's uses that a lot. Um, they're using that urea formaldehyde glue. Right, and a lot of times when guys do that, um, oh, Brian, you need to mute the video that's in the chat room. Um, they're using that urea formaldehyde glue. Yeah. Um, one thing about urea formaldehyde, it has a low um, creep um, factor. So you get a rigid glue line, and the shape that you clamp the workpiece in it, it stays there. There's very little, if any, spring back from what I've read. Okay. The um, the guy that I trained with in Chicago, Jeff Miller, um, he's really big on uh, a lot of bent lamination furniture. Um, he's had a couple of posts or a couple of uh, articles recently in uh, Popular Woodworking. Um, did like the uh, that arch table, and uh, he uses um, I believe he uses uh, West System or System Three, like T eighty eight epoxy. Yeah. He's well, used that for years. He's he swears by that stuff. Yeah. Arch Spagnolo uses that because you can buy it in these uh, large containers. Yeah. They have a pump, 
and the pump automatically uh, dispenses in the correct ratio? Yes, that's what the, the, that's what the West system epoxy does. Yeah, and he, he doesn't have to worry about the, um, the nozzle or the pump getting clogged because it's not with its activator. Yeah. So he just has the two cans duct taped together, mm -hmm. take a Dixie cup over there and go squirt, squirt, mix, 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 yeah. and he's good to go. Yeah, the squeeze bottles are a real pain because the viscosity of one is a lot different than the other, so it's tough to tell how much you're right. getting out. It uh, looks like uh, Beth glued her fingers together today with the, uh, I think oh. this is the uh, CA glue. Oh, well, yeah, I've got a, I, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> I spilled a bottle of that stuff once. On what? Uh, myself and the ground and the part I was gluing. Oh my god. I was on vacation and I glued, uh, I had a cut and I couldn't find any band-aids so I used some CA glue to kind of keep it closed. I used that here. When I sliced my finger open, my thumb open, uh, cutting uh, French bread at um, for spaghetti dinner and I have a really big cut Probably won't be able to see it. You don't need to see that <laughs> here. And that was uh, I first used the blow dryer to make sure it wasn't wet, <laughs> and then I shoved a bunch of super glue in there. And uh, my this was this was a long time ago. My girlfriend pushed it together on both sides till the glue stuck. <laughs> Wait, Matt, you keep uh, you keep CA glue in the kitchen when you're uh, cutting French bread? Uh, it was in the junk drawer. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'm posting a link to the chat um, of a of a cut that I couldn't actually use CA glue on. Um, yeah, I saw your safety week post. That was that was great. I won't <laughs> eat, I won't eat hot dogs for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um. One question I don't, I've never really understood. When you buy CA glue, it comes in those childproof containers, even the solvent. So if you glue your fingers together, the last thing you want to do is fight with a childproof container to get the solvent out. <laughs> yes. Adult-proof containers. Yes, yeah, that's right. My camera keeps trying to autofocus in the most unfortunate situations. So one thing I think we, it's uh, time to announce now that we've got kind of critical mass is that um, Gorilla Glue is actually going to join WoodChat on July 11th, Wednesday, July 11th. Um, so one of the things we want to do today is try and get uh, questions or topics or anything that WoodChat would like to ask uh, Gorilla Glue. Um, Andy obviously knows a lot about Gorilla Glue. He's got a... You want to describe your relationship with Gorilla Glue, Andy? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I basically do uh, part-time contract work for them on the side. I've uh, worked at the last three woodworking in Americas. If anyone's kind of come by the booth at WIA, you probably met me. Um, and uh, you know, I've done some articles and helped them with some testing and new product uh, tests. Um, like a few other woodworkers that are out there right now. So it's not my day job, but uh, it's, uh, it's fun and it's convenient, and they're here in town. That's cool. So you did a, um, a glue line creep test. You want to talk to us about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, what's that? I, I tried to read through that. I did read through it, and there's a lot of data in there. Yeah, there's there's a it was you know obviously part of a part of a study that I needed to do for them um, that they that they contracted me to do. Um, basically, you know there's there's a lot of um, a lot of lore out there around this whole concept of or this phenomenon of glue creep, and the idea is that you basically get a little bead along a glue line that appears um, after you glued it and finished it and it's all done. Um, and it usually is just kind of a thin, thin line. 
that appears between two joined boards. Mostly it's, you know, it's obviously going to be apparent on like a tabletop or a panel glue up. I've never experienced that, you know. I don't, I don't, I can't relate. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, um, if, you, if you, it's funny because some people have never experienced it. Some people have experienced it once or twice and typically will blame the adhesive. Um, and sometimes people will experience it all the time. Is it something so, that moves? Is it something that moves in and out with uh, the temperatures, or when it when it creeps? Are they saying it it just stays out? Like you'd have to re-sand it smooth again. Um, you can sand it smooth again, um, and usually that solves it. Um, there's there's a lot of different theories. Um, everyone from Franklin Industries, you know, for um, tight bond, and and then there's a lot of other university studies that have been done around it. Uh, you know, that have tested everything from uh, clamping pressure to you know environmental effects to the wood grain direction. Um, it, it's a pretty pretty broad range of factors that could potentially influence it. Um, I think one of the, you know, we tested uh, the first round, the, the link that was posted earlier. Um, the first round we tested seven different products. So we did um, uh, liquid high glue, uh, which was tight bonds. We did tight bond one, two, and three. Uh, Elmer's wood glue max, um, Gorilla Glue polyurethane, and Gorilla uh, PVA, which is just a type two um, wood glue. Um, and then I tested it on six different species of wood. Um, what we ended up doing after the boards were glued up and we finished, we also applied lots of different finishes. So I did uh, poly polyurethane, shellac, um, Watco, Danish oil, and then just no, um, uh, no finish at all. And then we ended up, throw we, we let them sit for about, eight weeks and nothing really happened noticeable. And then we kind of accelerated some of the environmental factors that would potentially impact it. So we, we put them in a, an environmental chamber that tested a um, combination of temperature and humidity, some extremes that would probably represent like a, a Florida type um, climate. And we found some, you know, I mean, there. It, it, there is, there is, it definitely didn't seem to correlate with anything in terms of the wood species, um, but there were some other things that we're going to continue to look at that I think do have a potential impact on, on glue creep. Um, I think uh, the one thing that came, became very apparent is that any kind of um, water-based glue, uh, in particular like hide glue or water-soluble, that almost failed immediately every time. You'd either get the, the joint that would start to fail or you would actually have the, um, uh, the, the glue creep appear over the, the line, the surface itself. Like the glue would get, even though you had taken the glue and sanded it flush, the glue would raise above the yeah. surface? Yeah, so I, I think I think what goes on, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, wood is finicky. You know, wood is going to move and push and contract and expand in all sorts of different directions. You know, it was a once living thing, and it's still susceptible to, you know, movement based on the environment and the humidity and temperature that it's in. And because the wood is a different chemical composition um, than the glue, I think it's going to be susceptible to those temperature and humidity changes at a different rate, which may cause the glue to, to raise um, where that glue line is. Okay. So the results of your experiment were that when you put those, put those boards in an environmental chamber and act like Florida, the water-based glues just basically gave up. Uh, well, they didn't completely fail, but they were the ones that had the most consistent and pronounced um, glue line uh, creep, and um, it was it was most apparent on high glue, which makes sense. I mean, it's a you know a, a glue that can be reversed with water, so I, I think 
you're, if you're putting it in an extreme environment, it's likely going to be susceptible to that and, and change the chemical composition of it. And the one that actually seemed to be the best were the, was the polyurethane glue. Um, it's obviously waterproof or fairly waterproof. Um, so it was least susceptible to the temperature and, and, and humidity changes that were going on. So obviously that's why it's always a good choice um, in an outside environment. I'm sure you'd probably see similar effects on, uh, you know, uh, like an epoxy or something like that. So there are some, some things that we're going to continue to look at, which includes grain direction, um, grain direction of the wood. Um, if you've got uh, flat sawn versus quarter sawn uh, grain and you're gluing up next to each other, you're going to have um, some differences in, in wood movement there, which then may exacerbate the, the actual... <laughs> Sorry. What are you doing there? Well, I'm trying to get my forehead off the camera. <laughs> I don't know if I have any good options. It's either that or look up my nose. <laughs> and my camera keeps trying to autofocus, but I don't want Chris to bust up I'm on my shiny head here, so <laughs> I don't have a, I don't really have a good place to put this thing. I'm sorry. I I, I got to make a little stand. You know, a big tape dispenser, maybe, or something. You can put it on top of. Yeah, yeah. Super, Super Dave asked if if I tested the uh, the real hide glue for glue creep. Um, I didn't. It was the it was the tight bond liquid hide glue. I mean, you could you could test you could test all the different scenarios and adhesives to the you know to the end of time. Um, I'm sure you'd probably see something a little different. So, how did um, was there any difference in the PVA? Any significant difference in the different brands of PVA glues? Um, right now, it's inconclusive. Okay. How long until? Uh, until you post your next findings, um, we're we're kind of looking at what the um, the the boards um, that I just put together um, that just had, you know, the, the the picture that was in that post that you posted earlier um, before Woodchat. Those were basically the same seven adhesives, all using maple, um, and there's lots of variations in grain direction, flat sawn to flat sawn, flat sawn to quarter sawn, and then quarter sawn to quarter sawn, all on the same boards, just one finish. Um, we're going to put those in a, in a testing chamber and see, see what happens there. Yeah, Andy, you said you were going to leave uh, for another 8 to 12 months. You were going to be testing these boards and checking them and everything. Yep. Uh, is that still going to be in a basement in the controlled environment, or is it going to be in a room like, you know, an upstairs kitchen or dining room that does actually feel the fluctuations in temperature and humidity? The, the, the boards right now are in uh, a room that is susceptible to the normal changes in seasonal, you know, seasonal okay. humidity and temperature. Yeah, you definitely, you obviously don't want to keep it in a controlled environment. Yeah, you know, you want it to to reflect the the environment in which the 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 wood would would ultimately live. Yeah. All right. So we had a question on Twitter from uh, Beth. She asks, "Do you trust glue alone for the long haul in long grain cutting board glue ups, or would you, or is another joinery option uh, needed as well?" Uh, Brian, what, what would you do? Oh, I think long grain would be enough. Um, yeah. I've done a I've done a couple uh, cutting boards to end grain. I mean, a la Mark Spagnolo, but uh, I've had no problems with movement, creep, or anything like that. And it's been a year and a half now, yeah. and nothing. Just make sure to use the waterproof glue, right? Yeah, Type Bond Three. Type Bond which Three, gives yeah. you, which gives you plenty of time for uh, the glue up for big glue ups too. So. Gluing and clapping, yep. Yeah. I guess other options for glue would be polyurethane or epoxy, right? Yeah, I mean, my honestly, from what I know, what I know on just what I've tested so far, I think any um, tabletop or panel glue up that I'm going to do from now on, I'm probably just going to go with polyurethane to never have to worry about it, you know. 
Really? Okay. I've never used polyurethane. It's something that I just haven't had to try. It's 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 you know it's different. Um, you you know it's got the the factor you gotta you gotta add you know some moisture to one of the surfaces and glue to the other. Um, that's one of the common problems that a lot of people end up having is they they don't frankly read the instructions and don't realize that you actually have to use moisture to kind of serve as that catalyst um, right. for the product to work. Okay. Um, you know the other thing is that it expands a lot, so people will you know, take a bottle of it and they'll squeeze it out and they'll put it on like they're frosting a wedding cake and yeah. next thing you know it looks like you've, you know, spray foamed your, your, your glue surface. Yeah, yeah. So how, how much, uh, the foam is a, is a result of having too much glue, right? Uh, well, uh, the foam, the foam is, the, is the actual chemical process of the, dry, of the glue drying and curing as a result of the moisture, which is why a lot of times, you know, people, if they left the bottle open or not sealed properly, it'll, it'll foam up. Um, okay. But, yeah, the foam, it, if you, the more foam, it's obviously the more, the more glue you add it, which you don't really need. Okay. You know, the good thing is, though, people complain about urethane glue as being messy in the foam. But honestly, if you remove, like removing polyurethane glue, I've found is, is infinitely easier than removing dried PVA glue. Dried PVA glue is like freaking concrete. I mean, you get tear out, you have, you know, you're, you're, you're terrified that either A, your scraper or planer is not, you know, sharp enough that you're going to tear up the board. Polyurethane glue, it, it, it peels off beautifully. I mean, you can use a cat, you can use just like a regular scraper and it works great. And that can be an hour later or 10 hours later? Uh, you're better off letting, you're better off doing that like 24 hours later. 24 hours, okay. Yeah. So if you have excess foam foaming, too much glue that you used, does it affect the strength of the joint or is it just wasted glue? Yeah, it's just wasted glue. Okay. I mean, the things that are affecting the strength of the joint, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's less about the adhesive and it's more about proper clamping pressure and, you know, just the, the quality of the joint itself. You know, a good, smooth, not glass smooth surface, but a smooth, flat, 90 degree surface to one another. I mean, those are, those are things that are important, especially with like a panel, you know, a panel glow up. Yeah, not, not burnished is the, the key. Not burnished, yeah. Okay. Um, how much, is there a, a danger of using too much clamping pressure with polyurethanes? Um, like, like, any, uh, like any adhesive, yeah. I mean, you, if you clamp it too much, um, you, you're going to squeeze it out and, and you'll starve the, the joint of, of any kind of adhesive. It doesn't take a lot. Okay. Um, now, I don't think you can overclamp a PVA adhesive. I think you can overclamp, overclamp an epoxy for sure. But I don't think a PVA can be overclamped. What contributes to that? Like, what are the, what are the differences? It's the way that it bonds in the wood. Um, there was an article, I think, was it Popular Woodworking just this week? Um, something about how it cures in the wood. And if you have, the more thickness you have, the weaker, it, the weaker it is. It's not bonding the wood fibers. It's bonding wood fibers with that glue in between. Okay. And the greater chance of failure then. So does the joint not get, isn't there, isn't there a chance, though, if you clamp it too hard that you'd, you'd squeeze out too much glue and weaken the joint, or... Yeah, too much clamping pressure, it, it, you know, it, you're, you're definitely going to starve the joint entirely. I mean, there's a lot of times people talk about testing the optimal clamping pressure, you know, and they'll, they'll get all sorts of, you know, torque wrenches and, and, you know, test it based on pounds per square inch, and that, that's ridiculous. I mean, who the hell is going to spend that much time, you know, <laughs> being, yeah. being sure that they're applying the right amount of clamping pressure, you know? Yeah, I, you know, when I used to work on my uh, 68 Chevy pi pickup, I, I never used the torque wrench, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I didn't have any problems. 
Okay, so right now we're looking at a picture of Brian's cutting board, which you made. Uh, actually, why don't you tell us, Brian, about how you made it? Um, it actually made five different cutting boards for Christmas gifts. And uh, I, my wife wanted a kitchen prep table, which I haven't made yet, but I was trying to figure out how much material it would take to make a six-foot-long butcher block uh, cutting board for the top of a prep table. And I actually forget how much material I bought for it, but it, uh, it came out pretty well. A lot of scraping on it. I didn't have any hand planes. That whole thing was flattened with a... With a, with a, you know, card scraper. Oh, my God. Yeah, tell me about it. You're, you must have no thumbprints left. <laughs> no, and no magnet either. I found about found out about, like, the uh, refrigerator magnet trick on the back of a card scraper to keep, like, I found out about that after the fact, so. Oh, so your thumbs were a little warm? Yeah, yeah. Holy but it was, in the, it was in the middle. There's four up here, though. There's a number four up in the corner. It, I had no idea how to sharpen that thing. Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah. What, what kind of glue did you use? That was Type On 3. Okay, and then what kind of uh, finish did you apply? Uh, armor Seal. Both sides? Both sides, yeah. Okay. And how long ago did you make it? That was right before Christmas this past year. And so they're, they're all staying nice and flat and straight? Yeah, no problems with it. Great. Great. So. Cool. Is that end grain? It's all end grain, yeah. That's yeah. a beautiful... Cutting board, Brian. Thank you. Nice it, al it also looks like you uh, kind of kept the pieces together because I can see how, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but the grain here yeah. seems to chevron with the grain uh, in the adjacent piece a little bit. Yeah, I tried to keep it together as much as I possibly could. Six, six feet long. Six feet long, and there's, there's actually another 16-inch piece that didn't fit in my clamps, and I couldn't fit it in that glue up. Okay. Right. So you could fillet a bluefin tuna on that thing. <laughs> cool. Wow. All right. So we've got about uh, 15 minutes left. Why don't we work on trying to get some questions um, uh, for the Gorilla Glue representative on July 11th? Okay. Or we could just do that as homework. Yeah, we could do that too. So July 11th, we will be having a Gorilla Glue rep on the Hangout with us here. And if you can think of some questions uh, and save them for that date, then we can ask them then. All the hard questions, right? Now, I'm interested to know if they're coming out with any new products, like um, a tinted PVA glue like Type Bond 3, maybe that's a little bit more waterproof. Um, I wouldn't mind bulk epoxy, um, bulk. like they have for West Systems. Yep, five by the five gallon bucket. Well, I don't know if I need five gallons, but maybe a gallon and a quart. And then um, I use a lot of the um, the CA glue that requires an activator, um, especially if I have a piece that chips off and I need to put it back in a way where nobody knows. I'll use the the CA glue, and I'm, I'm just kind of wondering um, if they're going to come out with more woodworking, woodworking, spe woodworker specific glues. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see dovetail tape. Dovetail tape? Have you guys seen dovetail tape? Dovetail yeah. tape? Dovetail tape. It's the best, best invention ever. I want to. I'd like to see it available around here. I'll try to find it. Here it is. Um, I'll bring it up on screen in a minute here. Yeah. I have no idea what you're even talking about. Yeah, I think it sounds like an April Fool's joke. <laughs> um, it's along those lines, but it's real. What? Um, I'm bringing up a picture here. I'll, I'll get it in a sec. What? Okay. Oh. Beth found uh, the expansion of the polyurethane glue to be troublesome in her, her one time using the Gorilla Glue. And that's a fact of too much glue, is that right, Andy? Um, yeah, I mean, it could be a combination of either too much glue um, or, I mean, it depends on just, 
the, the expansion was the expansion over the the edge itself, or was it was it kind of squeezing out a little bit? Like what what was the kind of glue up, glue up that she was using? Good clamping pressure certainly is important with when you're using Gorilla polyurethane glue. Um, that you know, obviously the expansion is going to obviously push things out a little bit. So keeping you know good clamping pressure on it is is going to be important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clamping is always important, no matter what kind of glue you're using. Having enough pressure and the right type of pressure. And especially when you do odd shapes, it's really important to to do a dry fit to plan ahead. Figure out if you need any specially shaped calls or anything. And also have clamps as well. And properly. A, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Oh, she says it was a chair repair, and the joint looked like it threw up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if if it is a chair repair, you know, it was a probably a, a loose a loose mortise and tenon, or maybe a, a dowel joint or something, and there may have been a, a void in there that obviously accepted a lot of glue. So the glue then expanded and then kind of squeezed out. But once once it uh, you know once you clear it up, though, uh, you know, it's just a matter of you know scraping it away or paring it away. It's definitely gonna. It's definitely gonna behave differently than than a PVA glue for sure. I mean, they're two just different types of glues, you know. So they're going to dry and behave differently from one another. And I think a lot of times people just expect, well, glue is glue. It's gonna work the same way like a, a traditional wood glue, but it's gonna, you know, polyurethane glue is gonna behave differently, just like epoxy. There was a um, interesting question in the chat room earlier that we missed, which was um, it was from Beth again. Um, are there any food safe issues with the different glues? Um, I don't. As far I don't. as I know, um, I'm sorry. As far as I know, I think once once the glue has has dried, most of the volatile chemicals have kind of dissipated, um, so it's going to be fairly safe. Um, at least for polyurethane and the, and the wood glue. I mean, you obviously don't want to chip away at it and eat it, but uh, for like cutting boards and things like that, I don't think you really need to worry about it. And it's all sealed into with the finish. Right. If you put a finish on it, I guess. Yeah, I'd be I'd be worried more about either the finish or the food that's left behind that's going to give you some sort of salmonella. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just just don't soak the cutting boards in water. You got to wipe them clean. You can't soak them in water. Wilbur posted a link to the giant to the um, dovetail tape, but I can't get it to open. Yeah, I'm trying to. Get it. I've got it open, but I can't share my screen. I can't share the right screen. <laughs> oh my god, this is great. <laughs> um, can you put the link in the chat room and I'll open it? Um, open it. Here. I just keep getting an error message. That's awesome. It's even got the grain in there and everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, there's a oh, link in the chat room. Uh, maybe you, you can... Right. You put this on uh, your IKEA furniture? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be cool if it was a paint stencil tape so you could just dye or, you know, put a coat of shellac on your end grain and then... Yeah, they're all machine yeah. cut dovetails, though. Look, they're all even. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's a niche market there. Hey, that's to awesome. make some uh, London pin dovetail tape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Would you guys buy that? Oh, uh, God, no. Well, maybe as a joke. If I was <laughs> products, I'd buy it as a joke. 
I suppose if yeah. you were like packing up stuff, you know, it'd be good for like somebody if like you were if you made small wood boxes and you could pack it up with that. That would be kind of a cool little added touch. Or yeah. maybe put some on the corner of your luggage or something. You could really pick it out at an airport. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's even got the grain. <laughs> wow. Where is it made? Is it? It's not made in the U.S. Is it? Uh well no we're open that one right now. It's made in, made in uh the UK I believe it's not made anymore though. <laughs> I, I tried to get that some. stuff is going for ten bucks. Let's see if he still has it in the shop. Uh, here. yeah. No, it's gone, Matt. I've I've checked. Uh, Unless you've tried to buy it back. You couldn't put it up. Couldn't get yeah, it on I've your table. Yeah, I've been trying to rally a bunch of back. Yeah. No, not on my table. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, dovetail spline side, dovetail key tape. A whole niche market here. You know, even if you don't like the tape, the look of the tape mat, you can use it as a template for cutting your dovetails. Yeah, you could. You see that James. Oh, uh, the line. Crit. Kringel says he's going to put it on his ductwork installation. Yep. Let's see if the customer. <laughs> <laughs> I dovetailed my uh, uh, together by hand. Geez. Oh my god, that is funny. Okay, so we've only got about uh, eight minutes left. Are there any other uh, questions or topics we should cover? How about um? Ways to unbond your hands when you glue them together with CA glue. <laughs> you guys ever been there? I have. Well, okay. This, yeah. Favorite this is solvent, which works, works all right. Um, What's that? Yeah, I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, hot, hot soapy water does a good job. And then if you can just find uh, something thin to pry into in between your hands or whatever to get to try and work them loose. You know what and works really well? just uh, hot water, a lot of it gently work it apart. There's a, there's a technique you can use. I'm going to try to hold this pencil up here. So if, if, you're, if your fingers were, were glued together, you basically take a pencil and you, you rotate it slowly, and there's kind of like a wedging action that slowly wow. will, will pry the skin apart. It's actually a lot less painful. Um, I know that's one of the recommendations that we'll make once in a while for people who have glued up their glued up their fingers. It it just makes the mechanical removal of it a lot easier. The best way to deal with it is actually just wear some gloves. Yeah. Does PVA does PVA glue eat through regular rubber gloves yeah. or no? Or not PVA glue, uh, polyurethane glue. P no, I'm not that I know. Um, I mean, it will. Yeah, you want polyethylene gloves. Okay. Don't stick to polyethylene. What about uh, nitri the, the nitrile gloves, the blue ones? Yeah, it will, it will wear through those. How long does it take to wear through? Um, I've used them for finishing pens that I've turned, sea glue, and um, it's not, not that long, at least five, ten minutes maybe. You're I went to the fingertips in the like session. You your hands together more than once there. Um, <laughs> no, I have my hands, and then I'm, I'm careful once I do that, just to keep my, my hands, my fingers apart until it dies. And then they're all, they're all stiff, right? And the gear and breaks down. So my, uh, my technique, if I, don't just, if I don't just take my fingers and pull them apart with force... Is I just take a um, yeah a razor blade and I'll, I'll pull them to pull them apart so I can see where the skin is and where the glue is and I just, I just <laughs> slice them. and 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 at the most I'll get yeah. just the top layers of dry skin and it doesn't doesn't really bug me. And if you do cut yourself bad, you've got the uh, CA glue in the junk drawer right there, right? Yeah, I just rub some dirt on it and I'm good to go. So exactly. Speaking of adhesives and cuts, have you guys used that uh, liquid skin or liquid bandage stuff ever? No. 
It's like a, it's you buy it at like you buy it at a pharmacy. The stuff, it comes in sheets, right? Yeah. No, no, no. This is like it's an actual. It's no. it's like a. It's just like a little. It's like a little glue, a little bottle of glue. But oh, that's can, like the Dermabond. Dermabond, yeah. Yeah. So so the lick, so I've I've had. Gosh, it sounds like I get a lot of injuries, but none of these were woodworking related. Um, <laughs> when I went when I went in for my thumb and I had put super glue on it, um, she pulled out Dermabond which is super glue that they sell in the medical industry for... Sterilized. Yeah, it's probably, you know, 20, 20 times the cost, and they use one little bottle, and then they throw it away. And that was Dermabond, but I had a bad burn on my arm, and they had these sheets. A sheet? That were, um, it wasn't glue. It was just a, a cold, gelatinous sheet, like a very thin uh, rectangle of, of jello. And they set that on my uh, burn and wrapped it up, and it instantly cooled it and felt felt great. And matter of fact, I can't remember which arm it was. I, I pointed at this arm, but I now I think it was this arm. Um, a whole, um, you know, like at uh, big events, people will have a big percolator of coffee to feed, to give coffee to 40 or 80 people. Yeah. I had one of those dumped on my arm. Oh, my God. And um, they just covered me, covered me with those, with those, and... It was it was a miracle. So, wow! I hate when that happens. Yeah. yeah, it was it was really fun, really fun when that happened. So, how hard is a uh, polyurethane glue to rub off yeah. your fingers? Because I know that like I used to use uh, Type on three a lot, and if you get that on your fingers, you can easily rub your fingers together and it comes off. While Type on one, it doesn't. You can't rub it off your fingers that easily. You almost have to use like a like a pumicey kind of soap. Yeah. So your question was about the polyurethane glue. Yeah, does that just rub right off or no? No, you, it, it's gonna it's it's gonna be on for days or a week in some cases. It, it it's you know just gonna wear off based on just the natural you know exfoliation of your skin, mm -hmm. um, which is why Gorilla Glue always suggests that you actually wear gloves. I mean, it's the one thing again where people just have to have a very different mindset. When you're using a polyurethane glue versus a wood glue, you know wood glue you can just kind of rub off or you know go back to the sink yep. and, and you know scrub it off a little bit. But polyurethane glue, it's it's a very different story. What um, what kind of gloves would you recommend wearing? Um, you know latex gloves. I use uh, the nitri nitrile gloves. I can't pronounce it, but I, I you know. For the amount of time that you use the gloves when you're gluing something up, those work fine. Mm -hmm. I get my gloves at Costco. Yeah. Uh, or or I'll, so I'll get some stuff at Amazon. I get my stir sticks at Amazon. Uh, I get my little paint mixing cups there too, and. Um, have you guys tried those silicone brushes? No, I don't bother. I, you can get those little acid brushes. No, what I find works really well. Yeah, those things are. Yeah, I like um, uh, little white, uh, yellow plastic um, putty knives. You can buy them like a dollar, two dollars each at your home home store, and you can get them one inch, like one inch, three inch, and five inch. I think they are. So they're really good big surfaces that blew up. Yeah, I just used um, some 16 inch, 16 inch thick um, strips of wood that I just had extra left over when I was uh, applying the glue on my bench top, like all those laminations. I just used that. Works fine. Mm -hmm. Stephen Marin um, yep. saw Rockler's silicone glue brush. And he was at the dollar store and found a small silicone basting brush. Took it home, cut the bristles short, and he's been using that, and he loves it. And it's, you know, like one eighth the price of the Rockler, Rockler one. But I, I find myself using those um, cheap acid brushes. You can buy them by the gross for pretty cheap, and I go through those a lot. On the on the on the well, up, I probably went through twenty. Are those like the chip chip brushes or the. No, they're the little metal tubes with really cheap 
Well, yeah, I'll just oh, okay. The black with the black yeah, bristles. Yeah, the, the black, black bristles. bristles yeah. yeah, I use those a lot too for smaller, smaller surfaces. A lot of times when I'm doing a, a wide edge glue up, I have one of those glue bottles that has the roller where the glue comes out right onto the roller. Yeah. That, that really, that really saved me some yeah. time. And if I'm doing a really big one, I have a wider rubber roller, and I'll just dump the glue out and roll that. First, I'll spread it out with a scrap of wood and then roll it. But um, yeah, it's. I, I haven't tried the silicone. I, I would probably lose it. So then I'd be. <laughs> Then I'd be ticked <laughs> off, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would avoid using the chip brushes you guys have because any... when, whenever I use the chip brushes, the bristles seem to come out in the glue, and then you're in, you end up having to pick out the bristles. Yeah. Yeah. That could happen with those cheap um, yeah, brushes. I get... Sleepy Dog had a question here. Yeah. Um, his question was, uh, why can glue manufacturers make a top... Uh, that will close. Well, I guess it's supposed to be why can't glue manufacturers make a top that will close and not get all gunked up? Um, yeah. You know, that's 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 the fifty thousand dollar question. Uh, well, maybe the fifty million dollar question. Uh, you know, I think uh, Gorilla Glue has made some changes yeah. to their polyurethane bottle, the smaller ones, or it's got a, a tighter screw cap and a, a metal pin at the top, which prevents the moisture and air from getting in, which is one of the big complaints where things would get kind of dried out. Um, the other, you know, the other bottles of like polyurethane or uh, PVA glue, I think across all the manufacturers, I, I haven't really seen anyone that really seems to stand out and remain gunk free. Yeah, it, it is the $50,000 question. If, if Teflon is nonstick, how do they get it to stick to the pans? Things like that, right? I mean, it's. Um, I mean, it's glue. It's supposed to stick to things. How does it not stick to the top? I just find myself periodically removing the top, um, and e either using needle nose pliers or a, s a scrap of wood to pull out any blockage. Or sometimes I'll just put the just the just just yep. the top part that goes up and down. Sometimes you can just pull that off and take that out. It's, it hasn't really been a problem. I, I gotta imagine there's some industrial or some sort of um, chemical that they could apply on the inside and the outside of the cap that would prevent the glue from kind of adhering to it. Yeah. Like there was a there's a, a couple of college students that came up with this spray adhesive that they can put on the inside of bottles for like ketchup. It was on the internet a while ago. Yeah, basically, not, yeah. I wonder if you could put that inside of a glue bottle in a cap. Uh, I'm sure well, you could. What's supposed to happen is the glue, the glue bottle is supposed to be made of a material that doesn't, that the glue won't adhere to, like polyethylene. But but if it gets scratched, then it provides a mechanical bond uh, somewhere for glue to bite into, and that's when it gets clogged up. And that's why you shouldn't use a nail or a drill bit to clean out um, CA glue caps, because once you do, then it starts to, then it gets scratched, and then the glue starts to dry up and cure and stick, and then there's no end of the troubles. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. The more you know. Things you learn. <laughs> I, w I wonder if the Gluebot, I wonder if the Gluebot product um, has a better top for that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it, but I know there's a lot of people who uh, seem to like the Gluebot. Yeah, what I what I like is a glue bottle that you can fill from the bottom. You can well, actually that one I guess would do work because when I use when you use glue, of course, you want a full bottle when you're doing a big glue. You're not turning the bottle upside down for half an hour before the glue comes out, and you don't want to put the new glue on top of the old glue. So that that could work. It works from the bottom. It fills from the bottom. From the bottom. Yeah. The, the glue bot the the dispenses from the bottom and you fill it from the top. So I think it's. I think that would I think that would solve the yeah. problem. Well, is 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 part of the problem of the cap drying out so much is because when you close the cap and then put the bottle down, air sits at the top of the bottle, allowing that glue at the top to dry a little bit. Yeah. If the cap if the cap was at the bottom and always stayed wet or always stayed in contact with the glue and the air was at the top, would it ever dry out? 
M maybe, I've but I think... I've heard of guys think... storing their CD. Hold on. You go ahead, Chris. Uh, um, oh. I've heard of guys storing their CA glues up and down. Oh, that's, that's, a... that's all I have to say there. Because you're supposed I know, like, paint, like old paint cans, you're supposed to, you know, hammer it shut, flip it upside down, and store it upside down so that it never dries out. Well, I, didn't I that. think I the realized. theory behind that is all the... It, it will dry up, but when you turn it back upside down, that dried paint goes to the bottom of the can, and you're taking off the top. That's the theory there, I think. Okay. And also it seals the can. Yeah. I think part of the problem with glue bottle tops getting clogged is that they um, were rough on them, and I don't know if they get closed. It's not a perfect seal, right? I think part of it is the contamination. Um, yeah. What was that, Bill? I, I think part of it is the contamination you get from the sawdust as you're putting uh, the glue on, getting sucked back into the cap. Could, could be. I know that my old glue bottles, if you look at the top, I mean, so typically the way I shut my glue bottle when I'm doing a glue up, let me see if I have something that can be a proxy for a glue bottle. Pretend my red office space stapler is a glue bottle, and this is where the glue comes out. I usually take it and slam it on the edge of my bench to close it. Okay? <laughs> so the more yeah. I use it, the worse the top gets, um, and you don't get a good seal, and so any of the glue that gets trapped... Because you have that spoon that comes up with the top on the top. Any of the glue that gets trapped in there is going to be exposed to air and just dry out. Um, so what? So I don't buy the big bottle and refill little bottles because I know that I'm going to wear out the, the top. So I just buy lots of little bottles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're easier to hold up too. Which formula of tight bond do you prefer? Um, I usually do the tight bond three, but mostly that's because I work with a lot of walnut, and it just seems to match better. So, but lately I've been using a lot of the Gorilla PVA glue, the white Gorilla glue. It's not a polyurethane glue. Um, I got kind of turned on to that at Woodworking in America when they were letting you turn in little old used bottles of Elmer's glue and you get a nice big bottle of yeah. Gorilla glue, so... Yeah, that's a popular one. Yeah, matter of fact, that reminds me, i got to go into my garbage and dig out all my old glue bottles and bring a sack of glue bottles with me to Woodworking in America. Limit one bottle. <laughs> per day. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and when the staff rotates, you can work your way in there. I'm there almost all the time. You can bring your, you can send your buddies over. <laughs> Matt, Matt's going to be blacklisted from the Gorilla Glue booth. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're probably going to say, we've given you so much glue, you have to, you have to come up with a Gorilla Glue wrap. <laughs> yeah. That sounds painful. Very. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what it would be like bringing a half-empty bottle of glue through customs. <laughs> as long as in your, it's in your luggage and it's not I in your uh, carry-on, yeah, I imagine yeah. it's fine. Or it's less than two ounces, right? Yeah. So, Bill, um, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I was going to ask you, you, you do a lot of uh, what I'll call engineering-type woodworking. Yes. Um, what kind of adhesives have, have you been exposed to that you've thought of using in your woodworking? Oh, there's a variety of many of the CA glues. Um, I like type bond three and two uh, for different applications. Uh, I've used West Systems epoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, there, any number of different adhesives. Uh, it depends on how much strength I need for the project I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to bond mixed materials, whether it's glass or tile or metal or? whatever with wood and how to use different adhesives, like a construction adhesive or... Yeah, it's, it's funny you should mention that. I, um, uh, hang on a second, I'll grab it. I know up here in the northwest we have Boeing and um, 
I've been in a lot of friends' garages where they've brought home special adhesives from work. And uh, these industrial industrial glue systems are a lot like a um, the pneumatic caulking gun with um, very you know kind of a very special applicator and um, you know they're gluing they're gluing metal together and it's stronger than a weld sometimes so. I I found um, I was at a uh, at a model airplane show believe it or not. Uh, one day, and there's a fellow there who had a display, and he was bonding all sorts of dissimilar materials together, copper, wood, ceramic tile, etc. Um, and he had this product, and it was, um, I think uh, probably see that there. Yeah. It's called Tech Bond, and it's called a molecular bonding system, and there's several different kinds in here, and they'll put almost anything together and very strong. Uh, so I got a set of that and uh, I've used it a couple times since. I'm not sure if he's got a website or anything I could share, but um, uh, let me look at his folder. What kind of a piece is it? Let's see. It's made from a mysterious substance that fell from an asteroid uh, thousands of years ago. <laughs> Glows green and uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, let's see. I'm trying to, to see if he yeah, has a, a, a website here. so folks can go look at this up. Yeah, it's um, www.tech-bond.net. So techbond.net. Um, and it really doesn't tell me a whole lot about what kind of glue this is. I know that there's one portion of it that's CA-like. There's another that has a bonding agent uh, that you sprinkle on the wood. It's like uh, a filler. So it's it's just, and it's really unique. It's not um, it's not for everyday projects. What do you got there, Chris? This is a piece of dogwood, and it's finished with CA glue. I thought it would be interesting to show. It's a really high gloss, but you can knock down the gloss as well. It's a really durable finish when it's uh, applied and built up a little bit. How do you finish it with glue? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually wrote an article about it. This is my sample piece here. You could do as large of a piece as you wanted. What you do is you use the thinnest CA glue. Uh -huh. And I think most of us sticking our fingers together, it is quite instant. But if you have it in a large puddle, a large pool, it doesn't cure instantly. Okay. So what I do is I I get a bottle of it and I pour on an amount over an area. I use a business card or something like that to spread it around. Uh -huh. And you try and get it as smooth as you can. And then once it's dried, you can use the um, the accelerator to cure it if you like. Once it's dried, you just rub it, rub it out and then you get the a nice, smooth, hard, super tough finish. And it's a really hard to break. That's cool. I've never even heard of that. You know, uh, one thing I was thinking about... One thing I was thinking about is there's not a lot of... Um, there's really only a few... Really only a few... Um, makers of glues that I'm familiar with, Franklin and, and Gorilla Glue. And I was, I remember a recent um, ad on TV from Loctite for DIY. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, are those really the only glue manufacturers besides, it's primarily Franklin for Type Bond, right? Yeah. Gorilla Glue does Gorilla Glue. Lee Valley sells the one that you use, right, Chris? Yep. You got Actually, Elmer's. Two, yeah. El Elmer's makes yep. the glue. I, ironically, Elmer's, uh, Franklin, and Gorilla Glue are all in Ohio. <laughs> well, there must uh -huh. be lots of uh, PVA. There must be a big PVA forest. Uh huh. Lots of horses. You know, it's funny. We talk a lot about all these different adhesives, and um, I mean, it, there's 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 one big distinction between 
liquid hide glue and then all the other glues that we've talked about tonight and and that's obviously the age and how long you know hide glue essentially has been around versus a lot of the other adhesives which are fairly new you know probably what 50 years or less and I remember um, at the first Woodworking in America show uh, where Thomas Mosier, or the first one that I was at, Thomas Mosier was there as the guest speaker and he came over and he was talking to me. I was at the gorilla booth and he said, you know, I have this recurring nightmare that, you know, because he uses a lot of uh, epoxy. Uh, he uses uh, West System uh, or System 3 epoxy. Right. And uh, he says, I have this recurring nightmare that, you know, before I die, all the pieces of furniture that have been made by by our our, our shop are all going to simultaneously fail. You know, it's like a it's a anxiety dream that he has uh, associated with with the adhesive. You know, because it's obviously newer versus high glue. Yeah, the PVAs have only been around about 50 years, right? I think so. Yeah. One thing you have to be careful with with epoxy glue, um, over time you can build up an um, a allergic reaction to it, um, mm. respiratory yeah. problems, oh. etc. Um, it's kind of rare, but if you're using epoxy every day, that's you know something to be concerned with. Mm -hmm. Protecting your skin, um, putting uh, the proper gloves and a barrier uh, on so that you don't get it all over you. Do any of you guys wear uh, respirators when you're using epoxy or mixing epoxy? Uh, occasionally. No. I, I've only used small amounts at a time, so I haven't. Um, if I was going to use a lot, I probably would. I yeah, find it's enough to open up the door and the box can. When I was building a lot of model airplanes, I used to use the respirator quite frequently. I was doing vacuum bag layups of, uh, you know, composite wings with balsa and uh, carbon fiber and fiberglass, and I'd, I'd wear it then. Yep. Mm. All right, well, we are way past uh, time. It's probably time to wrap this up. Any final comments? Do we know what we're going to be talking about next week? I know what we're talking about July 11th. Yeah. Or we could figure we could figure that out, I guess. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Cool. Any of this, guys? Well, shoot, shoot them off um, on Twitter. We would chat as the hashtag, and we'll we'll get a discussion next week. And remember the homework for the uh, gorilla glue conversation. Got to think of uh, some good questions right. for them. And I'll uh, I'll reach out to them myself as well, and and remind them that they're going to have a tough audience. So. <laughs> Right. Hey Andy, thanks a lot for joining us, sharing your blog and your the test that you ran and all the information you have about glue. I didn't think we could fill over an hour talking about adhesives, but we did, so it was very cool. And yeah. Brian and Bill, thanks for joining us as well. I no, thought thanks, it was pretty thanks fun. for having me. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Okay. Well, we'll see you next Wednesday, 6 p.m. 9 p.m. Keep your fingers unstuck. Yeah, keep your yeah. fingers <laughs> unstuck, everybody. See you guys. Good night. All right, guys. All right, ending broadcast. Good night.